our country is turning from our Judeo-Christian roots, and it's happening fast. Two years ago, in January of 2020, just before the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, George Barna's uh, research organization published their report, State of the Church in America 2020. And it informed us that the number of Americans professing to be practicing Christians dropped from about 50% in 2010 to about 25% in 2020. That was by far the largest observed faith decline in American history. But the COVID-19 pandemic has made it even worse than that, much worse. Researcher uh, Thomas Rayner um, predicts that the 20% of those who were attending church before COVID-19 will not return when it ends. I talked to Pastor Joe Trussell from the Church of God Holiness here in town at the conclusion of our church's Christmas Eve service, and he told me somewhere around 25% of that congregation has not returned since the shutdown of April, March, April, and May of 2020. His omission is common among pastors all across the country. But to be blunt, there is another major problem in the American church today. And it's a two-part problem. And the two parts are closely related. And honestly, both are part of a 25 to 30 year at least trend here in this country. Here's part one, lacking confidence in God's word. Many preachers and church leaders are watering down the hard teaching of the Bible. And that's not just those pastors and preachers who have come out of liberal seminaries, though it's about across the board with those groups. But they are compromising what the Bible teaches about salvation in Jesus alone, about gender and sexuality, etc. And youth ministers and student ministers across this country are reporting that many families are absolutely in free fall. Uh, one article I saw just this past week said 17.8% of American households are made up of married mother and fathers with their children at home. Only not quite 18% of all American households are married moms and dads with children still living at home. So that's part one. The second part of the problem is something that's not just recently developed by any means. And like part one, it has nothing to do with pandemic or politics. It has everything to do with discipleship or rather the lack thereof throughout the American church for decades. I strongly encourage you to get a hold of a copy of the three-part set from Ed Stetzer called The State of the Church in America when numbers point to a new reality. I would encourage you to get this. If you'll let me know, I'll mail it to you. But I would read it through a couple of times, pray about it, and keep in mind that it was published in 2016, so five years ago. And many of the issues that he reports on have contributed to what we see today in uh, where church after church are reporting 25% or more of church attendees or members um, prior to COVID-19 are no longer marginally involved now. And I mentioned a moment ago that there's a, a major part of the problems we see in the church in America today and subsequently the state of the culture we see today in our nation and all of its relating issues grabbing the headlines every day, are the result of the church's failure to make disciples of Jesus. Now, I want to clarify uh, some terms for you and give some brief explanations. So, um, in our church bulletin for Sunday, the 9th of January, there's a section entitled Disciple Making movements or DMM and in churches across the United States of America. Disciple making movements, DMM, in churches across America. Okay? And it defines a disciple as anyone who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is somebody who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. Disciple-making is entering into relationships 
to intentionally help people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join the mission of Jesus. It included evangelism on the front side and maturity in Christ, multiplication on the back side. A disciple maker is a disciple of Jesus who enters into relationships with people to intentionally help them follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join the mission of Jesus. That's a disciple maker. A disciple of Jesus who enters into a relation, relationships with people to intentionally help them follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join the mission of Jesus. A disciple-making movement, DMM, disciple-making movement, exists when disciples make disciples, making disciples, who plant multiple churches within a few short years, who in turn replicate making disciples who make disciples, who continue to plant churches, so that we can see at least four generations regularly produced in at least four streams of disciple-making. Multiplication and these streams multiply consistently into hundreds of churches in a few short years. And a disciple movement church is a church where disciple making is the core DNA of that church, the culture of the church, where the average church member makes disciples to the fourth generation. And this disciple making activity is regularly produced in significant and diverse streams within the church, and those streams multiply consistently into new churches. Now, the international disciple-making movement started in, interest, in, in earnest in the early 1990s. About 1% of the world's population is involved in a disciple-making movement now. 1% of the world's population. But there are some 1,400 of these disciple-making movements, and it's growing. Now, I want you to keep in mind that more Muslims have been reached in the last 14 years around the world than in the last 14 centuries, by many multiples over. But there's no clear disciple-making movements yet in the United States of America. But I want to be part of changing that, and you should too. All right, you'll hear those statistics from time to time in um, 2022 here at Park Street Christian Church as we chart new territory for the future of our church, I pray, and for this community and for our state and for our nation. Now, so churches, including Park Street Christian Church, who have had some upheaval or, or difficulties in recent years. As a result, they face a multi-pronged problem and the clock is ticking. But you know what, folks? All is not lost. Some people will cave in. Others will despair. And there are lots of people in lots of churches who are totally content with just attending when it's convenient, being involved when it's convenient, and all they care about is the local church existing keeping the doors open and the bills paid so they can come when it's convenient. And to them, that's that's what their relationship with Christ and His church is all about. Now, I'm not arguing whether those people are saved or lost. That's not my, my job, okay? That's up to the ultimate judge that I'll answer to as well, okay? But there's a lot of people in most churches that I know of who are content with just keeping things going as they are, the bills paid, the doors open. And that's all they really they are concerned about. But again, listen, there's an alternative path that we can take, and that is renewal, revival, and returning to God and to biblical discipleship. I believe that God has not given up on the church. I believe that His Spirit is still alive and active in His people, and His Word is still true, and He still changes lives. God's church for the world, or God's plan for the church for the world has always been plan A, and there is no plan B, Okay. It's still the local church where disciples of Jesus are being made who make more disciples of Jesus. And there again, that's God's plan A, and there's never been a plan B. And so that's why we're launching here at Park Street Christian Church this year our uh, at least 52-week emphasis on real-life theology. And there's an insert in our church's bulletin for Sunday the 9th of January about that. And we're also launching tonight in our Sunday night service uh, Sunday night 
time slot here at Park Street Christian Church at 6.30 and Sunday nights and every other Sunday uh, prayer meeting that I hope will be an ongoing emphasis here and moves to being more than just twice a month every other Sunday. Okay? One phrase I've heard over and over and over again the last uh, 21, 22, 23 months or so has been from both Christians and those who aren't is first something like this. I sure hope things get back to normal soon. And, or something to that effect, okay? I sure hope things get back to normal soon. I remember saying that myself in uh, March, late March of 2020. Not even two years ago. Now it's more like, I sure hope things, uh, I, I'm not sure that things were ever going to get back to where they were before. I'm not sure things are ever going to get back to normal. But may I remind you, friends, that as Christians, we're at the same place we've always been. We've been fairly good at saying that our hope isn't in this world, <clears throat> that it's not in our culture. But it's just now that we're actually seeing if we really believe that's true or not. Our hope still needs to be in something that's lasting and living because preachers and politicians and people will always fail. They'll always let you down. We're human. That just happens. It's the way it is in this fallen world. Political parties grow power hungry. Governments, government systems frequently fail. and Ours is closer to collapse now than any time in our 245-year history. Stock markets crash. New cars depreciate. Houses deteriorate. Supermodels get wrinkles. Olympic sprinters, gymnasts, and divers, professional athletes have, across the spectrum of athletics, 20 years from now will not be able to do what they once did. <clears throat> Things will change. We can't put our hope in what is physical or in institutions that are man-made. We can't put our hope in what is simply material. Again, over the last 20, 25 years, we've been good at saying we believe that's true. But I can't help but wonder if God's allowed all this to happen the last several months to get our attention. I think he's tried multiple times the last few decades to do that. I wonder if he's not trying to communicate to us, what if things don't ever return to normal? What you think's normal? Will you still be faithful? Will you still what will you do if the new normal is much worse than it is right now? When we think from a strictly spiritual perspective, we have to realize that regardless of who sits in the White House or serves in Congress or occupies the governor or the mayor's office in any municipality. We can't be blind to what is gradually taking place throughout our culture. Now, we've seen this for years. Former President Trump actually spoke in a church, I think it was the 19th of December, right before Christmas. He preached, he spoke at that church's worship service, and he said out loud, America has a Savior, and it's not me, he said. It already has the Savior it needs. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Savior America needs. He said that. Now, you didn't hear that on the mainstream left-leaning uh, leftist media in our country or hardly anywhere else. But he preached that on the 19th of December, just before Christmas, just uh, less than a month ago, that America has a Savior that needs to turn to, and it's Jesus, it's not him. And that's true. Now, I would hope that he would live that out, you know. But we can't be blind to the fact that, that sold-out believers for Christ are in a rapidly decreasing minority in this country. The Christian worldview is rapidly fading in our nation. The church, as a rule, has come up with ways to get people to make a decision for Christ, and they may or may not be saved. And some churches have experienced gains in membership over the last 30 years, okay? Um, but, as a rule, the church has failed to make disciples, followers of Jesus, who in turn make more disciples of Jesus. Now, disciples who make disciples of Jesus, and who make more disciples of Jesus, it's not a new concept. The Apostle Paul I wrote to Timothy about that in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and he says, The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others also. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples. It's a lifelong 
process from one generation to the other. And we failed. The battering ram of culture um, continues to chip away. And the laws and trends of our of our culture, of our time, are going to test our convictions in the workplace, in education, in the marketplace like never before in this nation. So this should be seen as a warning and a wake-up call to us in the church. You're going to need to determine your priorities and where your hope is because, <clears throat> and where, because there's going to be an escalation of challenges and tension for those who claim to be Christ followers. What we're experiencing seems strange to us. <clears throat> But it's already happened over and over again ever since the world, in the world, ever since the church began. Now, in the opening of First Peter, Simon Peter reveals one of Christ's closest friends, one of his inner circle of disciples, wrote a letter to Christians who were scattered throughout the known world at that time, who found themselves marginalized, discriminated against, questioned, mocked, and persecuted homeless, jobless in many situations. Many of them were unemployed because of their belief in Christ and because of their peculiar, distinctive lifestyle. And Peter writes to remind them their hope is in the resurrected Christ, not in the emperor who killed Christ. And so Peter writes this letter to Christians who've been forced to flee and to run for their lives, and they've basically gone to five different provinces that are part of what we would consider modern-day Turkey. Okay, so open up your Bibles if you have one close by to First Peter chapter one. First Peter is very near the very back of your Bible. Get Revelation and turn a few pages back to the middle of the New Testament, and you'll find First Peter. Look at chapter one. This book was written roughly in the mid uh, '60s, A.D. mid '60s, first century. If you're history buff, then You'll be well aware of what took place in 64 A.D. There was a huge fire in the city of Rome. It burned almost everything, but somehow Nero's estate went unscathed, and so did one of his best friends. So it raised a lot of suspicion in Rome. In order to divert some of the focus off himself, some of the scrutiny and blame, and in order to stop people from questioning him, why didn't he lose anything in this fire? Nero had to find a scapegoat. So he and his advisors chose to blame the fire on Christians, and they twisted the rhetoric in an effort to make Christians look like they were something they weren't. So fake news has been around for a long time. So Nero's PR people had three primary angles that they used. They said that this new religion of Christianity was really atheism, you say, well, why would they say it was atheistic? Because understand, the Romans believed it was fine to believe in any kind of God, except for a God that didn't tolerate all the rest of the gods. And Jehovah God has no rivals. Christians understand that. They're following Jesus, no other earthly leader, ultimately. And the Roman citizens all believe in many gods. That's what they were were taught to believe it was okay. You can go back to Acts 17 and see the evidence of this when Paul was preaching on Mars Hill. He encountered some Stoic and Epicurean philosophers and there was all these idols throughout Athens and they even had uh, one that was dedicated to the unknown God and he used that, of course, Paul did as a springboard to preach about the unknown God. He said, you know, he's not one that you can make with hands. He's made everything you see, in fact. But that's what the early church was accused of, a type of atheism, because they believed in one God only, and none of the gods that they believed in. The Roman Empire tolerated the worship of lots of gods, lots of idols, just not Jehovah. The second thing they did to claim that Christians, they claimed that Christians were cannibals, and they accomplished that by, you know, when believers took of the Lord's Supper, they <coughs> taught figuratively were sharing in the body and blood of Jesus. And so they took that, what was said figuratively, and claimed the Christians were doing that literally. Third thing they said about Christians was that they had incestuous relationships. Well, where in the world did that come from? Well, because believers would say commonly, I love your brother, I love your sister. And they used that as a springboard again, fake news, to claim the Christians were practicing incestuous relationships. 
And so they label them as an extremist fringe group that was really out there, and they ta tagged them with the crime of arson in Rome, and they succeeded in making Christians look like something they weren't. And it sounds familiar, and will get me to be more familiar with you. There are church groups in this country who, in recent years, have had megaphones, microphones, and hateful signs protesting at funerals and different events, some, sometimes causing Christians to label, um, causing non-believers to label Christians as judgmental, homophobic, hateful, radical, out of touch, anything to paint Christians to look like something they're not. So again, fake news has been around for a long time. Now, back in the first century, in order to carry out this ruse and to make the arson allegation really more believable, Nero chose to be brutal to the Christian population. So as a result of it, in the early second century, there was a historian by the name of Tacitus, Tacitus who wrote, writes about Nero, and I quote, burning Christians alive as torches to light his gardens at night, feeding them to wild animals for public entertainment. And so in all he had literally thousands of Christians murdered in Rome alone. That's the context of what Peter is addressing, okay? It's during this time of persecution that Peter writes this letter to those who are having to flee from the Emperor Nero. And uh, later in the early 2nd century, Tacitus uh, documents this. But Peter's writing can prepare us today in 2022 to handle suffering, how to live out our faith, because in the coming years we're very likely going to become extremely marginalized minority in this country. And I think that it's highly probable there will be persecution, open persecution of Christians in this country, just as what has happened every day since the church began someplace in the world and continues to this day in many nations around the world. Your foundation, what you really believe, is extremely important, and you need to be completely convinced about what you believe, because it may cost you everything in the near future. And that's why we're going to be studying what we're going to study in the next several months here at Park Street Christian Church in the study, Real Life Theology. So let's discover in 1 Peter 1, as we begin, how to find hope in the midst of this temporary world that's in chaos, we're going to look at two different sections. The first is, what's the source of the believer's hope? What's the source of the believer's hope? First Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. So as believers, we've been born again into Christ's family, there, and there's some really incredible uh, implications that go along with that. We're heirs to an inheritance that the God of the universe has for us. And he makes this very crystal clear here, stressing this inheritance is safe and secure. Peter uses a military term to describe this as inheritance is kept and guarded in heaven for you. God is keeping it, and he's protecting it for you. And it can never perish, spoil, or fade. I rent a house here in El Dorado Springs. But you know what? In a hundred years or so, that house will have eroded or deteriorated or perhaps a lot sooner than that if it's destroyed by a tornado or by fire. I can get food out of my refrigerator, sit it on the counter, and leave it there, come back just a couple of days later, and depending on the type of food it is, it will have already started to decay and spoil. Some foods will take longer than that, but they're not going to stay edible long. I have baseballs and footballs and basketballs and scores of other sports memorabilia that I've collected over the years, from the time I was a little kid till today, including the Little League Baseball I got when our team won our local league championship in Bloomfield, Iowa years ago when I was 12. And many of those memorabilia pieces have signatures on them from different people. But all those items are temporary, and those autographs have already started to fade, and so does the memory attached to them in time. But all of that stuff is just that stuff that's temporary. And in First Peter, he points out to us as Christians that God has promised you there is something that's never going to perish, spoil, or fade. Never. 
Now, if you just read this passage in 1 Peter 1 quickly or just glance over it or you're new to it and you haven't read it before, and I talk about this inheritance that we're going to receive in heaven, we're careful, we think that that, that alone is our living hope, that heaven alone is that hope. But friends, unbelievably great as heaven's going to be, and as priceless as your inheritance is, that's not in itself the, the living hope that's the centerpiece of this chapter. I think sometimes we get a little bit confused and think that our hope's in heaven alone, and that's yes, that's it, but it's not all of it. Okay? It's not heaven alone. Your hope is not also in your athletic achievements, your job security, if you're a young woman, your, your Pinterest wedding plans you're making. Uh, it's not in the years you spent designing and maybe building a, a house or whatever. Um, acquiring and maintaining a farm. Uh, our, our living hope isn't found in a place or it's found in a person. And his name is Jesus Christ and everything revolves around him. But he's, he, he's made our salvation possible through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. But it's easy to start looking for the hope, for hope in all the wrong places. And that's why we've got to daily stay in the word. Daily learning how to feed ourselves spiritually. The longer you're a Christian, the better you should be at feeding yourself. The more you should be dedicated to staying involved in your church's activities, its work services, its prayer meetings, those kinds of things. Because separated and alone, it's possible for you to lose your way. And the process, in the process, you start to feel pretty hopeless. And it troubles me greatly today to see so much fear in the lives of, of believers, of Christians. It does. I thoroughly enjoy watching sports from Olympic Games, all kinds of different sports, but mostly in the realm of amateur college athletics. But sometimes the backstories are just so compelling and riveting that they'll show some story, the behind the scenes story of this athlete, the challenges that they've had to overcome when they were told they couldn't do it and they proved people wrong over the years, sometimes overcoming incredible disabilities physically. But that athlete competes and achieves the unlikely and unexpected. I think we all love stories of hope, stories of overcoming, and stories of, of people who achieve great accomplishments over many obstacles. For the Christian, our hope is alive. And in verse 6 of our passage, the text tells us, there's a shift in this text that tells us, as Peter talks about the attitude we should have because our living hope is in Jesus who died and is alive now and is never going to die again. It says in verse 6, In this you greatly re rejoice, even though for now for a little while, for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. And when Peter says we should rejoice in this, you have to look back in the previous verses to realize that he's referring to Christ. His resurrection and the implications of that are eternal. We have an e eternal inheritance. In other words, he's comparing temporary difficulties and trials and problems with eternal rewards. And there's really no comparison. But the living hope isn't just about tolerating the present and the temporary in order to get to the eternal someday. It's not about living this life miserably through adversity and troubles and being discouraged and, and can't look forward can't look forward enough to eternity in heaven. But it's facing adversity and even death knowing I've got purpose every day until that day. And the only way we can do that is holding on to a living hope that we have in the person of Jesus Christ. But hope isn't just about the future, it's about our presence, about every day. 1 Corinthians 2.9, uh, Paul says, What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, what the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And the context of that verse is just, about, just as much about living now than it is about eternity. When things overwhelm you at work, or a friend betrays you, when a neighbor turns on you, or a friendly member or close friend passes away, as painful as those times are, this is an opportunity for our faith to shine and for our hope to thrive. First Peter 1 Peter 1.6, in this you greatly rejoice. How? Why? Because you've got this living hope. 
You aren't celebrating the suffering or the trouble. You're celebrating what in this refers to Jesus is our living hope. You see, the Christian's hope is alive. It's a living hope that you can't always see. Dying hopes are around us every day, and we see them easily. And people get excited about those types of things. The world continually promises multiple dying, dead-in hopes. And we get our hopes up only to realize that that team or the, that possession or whatever it is doesn't satisfy us long term. And when it's all said and done, it's not lasting. And even though for a little while compared to eternity, it might what we might experience here it might include some difficulties and some trials. He's reminding you to keep those trials and sufferings in perspective against the backdrop of our relationship with the one and only who offers eternal salvation. Now the second half of, half of this section, let's consider not just the believer's hope, but the source, the, the strengthening of the believer's faith. You've got the source of the believer's hope and then the strengthening of the believer's faith. Now, how does that take place? Well, one of the ways it happens, friends, is through tests and trials and even through persecution. In God's paradoxical way, he teaches hope through suffering. Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, that your Bible, at the next verse, verse 7, these have come, talking about these trials, difficulties, and obstacles, persecution, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's the end goal. The end result of an active faith of this living hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that our soul is saved. There's nothing more important than receiving the salvation that Jesus Christ alone offers and then helping those around us find what we have. And these words there where it says, so that, in verse 7, indicate the purpose of what Peter's talking about here. So that because of these things that have come, these trials into your life, the suffering that comes into your life, these rough times and difficult circumstances, these things have come into your life to provide you an opportunity to allow God to strengthen your faith. You lay a two-month-old baby down on a blanket on the floor, two, two and a half months, three months old, and it, it strains and, and, and labors to keep its head up, laying on its belly on that blanket. And it's frustrating and it's exhausting and it wears out and the baby doesn't like it and eventually cries. But it gets stronger and more able to hold their head up the more practice they get at that. And that straining, that, that wrestling with that process, that growing through that process produces greater strength in those neck muscles to hold their head up to where they can sit up and you don't have to worry about their head falling over. They hold their head up. But that happened. That process took straining and stretching and difficulty. And what was unpleasant at the time. Paul writes to the Galatian believers about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And he says these fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These nine fruit of the Spirit. They flourish in your life when you're in situations and you're tempted to choose to do the direct opposite of that fruit, the works of the flesh. And you choose to do the godly thing. That produces that fruit in your life. When you're in an environment, when the easy thing to do, the path of least resistance is to do the work of the flesh, the opposite of love, the opposite of joy, the opposite of peace, the opposite of patience, etc., that's when those fruit of the Spirit grow in abundance, is through having the choice to make and choosing God's way and godliness. The fruit of His presence in your life, rather than works of the flesh, depending on yourself. Now, some of you listening to this sermon live or online this morning, um, perhaps you're thinking, I don't think I can praise God in that kind of a situation. I don't think I can say God's good in the midst of my trials. I mean, I'm literally in a world of hurt right now. I know some of you are. 
And maybe some of you feel like your marriage is on its last leg. Maybe you, you're, you've just got an alarming diagnosis from a doctor. Maybe it just seems like all the medical odds are stacked against you, but your desire is for God to miraculously intervene and because he's your only hope. To others of you, your world of hurt maybe is that is about 40 hours a week where your beliefs are attacked and berated and your morals are maligned. Maybe your world of hurt is tied to the sudden economic downturn we've experienced the last two years in this country. And literally the wind's been knocked out of your sails. I talked to a 61-year-old man here in Elderly Springs just a few months ago now who works in Nevada, Missouri here at and he's worked for the same employer for 36 years. And he said his 401k literally has tanked in recent months. But for any number of reasons, if we're not careful over time, our hope becomes pretty hollow unless it's a living hope, an enduring hope. Now remember the setting and who it is that's receiving this letter in their inbox that Peter's wrote here. He wants these believers to understand these believers who have had to run for their lives and leave their homes or possessions and settle other provinces. He wants them to know, and he wants you to know, that if you have this living hope in Christ, it will produce joy even in the midst of suffering, and the result will be a strengthened faith. That's what he's saying. Your faith will be stronger. Your relationship with the Lord will be tighter and closer. But you see, you can't claim that he's your living hope and then cave in when the when you and question your faith you can't have a testimony without some test and trials are the proving ground of your faith there's a greater good that comes out of your suffering now please understand god is not some maniacal mastermind who gets his jollies out of your pain not at all the bible says he's the giver of every good and perfect gift that's who he is that's what he does but the Bible also teaches that we have a spiritual adversary who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And rest assured, what God permits, he has the ability to work for good in our lives. He's not some kind of a maniac that is masterminding you to have difficulty. Author and speaker David Jeremiah says it like this. He says it seems to, to be the universal testimony of those who suffer that it's a very clarifying experience for them. Pain is a type of preparation like no other, allowing the unimportant to fall away and the critical to rise to the top. That's what God ultimately wants in your life, is for you to, shape, to be shaped and molded into the image of Jesus Christ, where he is truly Lord of all parts of your life. He wants to develop your character into the likeness of Jesus. Romans 8, 28 and 29, and we know that all things... Works, God works for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. Well, what's his purpose? Verse 29 tells us, For those whom God foreknew, he also predetermined, predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, the image of his Son. God's goal for us all along is not just been to take us to heaven when we die, but to shape us to be like Jesus in the meantime. We see that in Colossians 1, where Paul writes in verse 28 and 29, Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. And the word for fully mature is the bullseye of a target, teleos. It's what the archers are shooting for when they practice hitting their target with their arrows. Hitting the target, hitting the bullseye on the target, teleos, maturity. Christ likeness in John 16 33 Jesus says I have told you these things so that you may have peace in this world you're gonna have trouble but take heart I've overcome the world and some translations or paraphrases they take courage keep the big picture but those words give us hope in a world of hurt no matter what life might throw at us we put our faith in someone who has overcome Jesus is on the cross the tomb is empty the tomb couldn't keep our living hope down. God's robbed the grave. And our living hope, Jesus Christ, is reminding us that he alone is worthy of our pursuit. He's tried and tested. And Peter is telling these early Christians, you have to decide where your hope is because there may be ridicule, there may be suffering, but you need to finish the race. I've told you before I love watching Summer Olympic Games more so than the winner, because 
I like track and field events and I have that connection in my hi my history and I like to watch all kinds of different competitions but especially the the races from sprints to long distance races and you see these competitors nearing the end of their race and they're just they've given everything they forgot they've trained for months and months it's been a lifestyle for them they're perspiring away it all comes down to that finish and you see how some of them just throw themselves across the finish line but can I tell you something the race that you're in, the journey in the Christian life, is more important than any Olympic race will ever be. And you've got to finish it. And you've got to finish strong and well. Don't drop the baton. Looking back at my life, there's been a lot of times when I've been guilty of just praying for an easy life. I think many of us have this tendency to pray, you know, Lord, just help things to go smooth. Just things, get things back to normal for me. Things start to go wrong or go south. We quickly pray, Lord, get me out of this. Help me. In the last several months, I've been reminded once again of the words of the Apostle Paul when he sat in a prison cell or at least under house arrest, one or the other. He wrote these words to the church in Philippi. For it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you're going through the same struggle you saw that I had and you hear that I now still have. Philippians 1, 29 and 30. Paul writes in the midst of those difficult circumstances, it's been granted to you to not only believe in Christ, but also to suffer for Christ. And that's good news, really. The first century Christians, when they heard that, they understood it was good news. What's the difference between the first century Christians and 21st century Christians? How is it that the book of Acts talks about when the apostles were flogged and, and beaten for preaching the name of Jesus Christ, they left that experience and said we, they rejoiced. They rejoiced. Why? Because they were considered worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Look at Acts chapter 5 sometime. See, my tendency is when I pray is want to avoid the suffering, the ridicule, persecution, difficult circumstances. My natural instinct is to take the path of least resistance. I'm guessing it's probably yours too. But what if we, rather than trying to avoid it, rather than fearing it, embraced it as part of the process in our journey of becoming more like Jesus Christ. Not because we want to have some martyr's complex, not like that, but so that people can see that when I suffer, my attitude is good. My faith is not just good when everything's easy, but, be but because I have faith in a living hope in Jesus Christ, I can rejoice and I can live and flourish and thrive when things are tough. You see, suffering in any form will either draw you to God or drive you away from God. One of those two things will happen. There's not really much static, neutral ground. Just understand that God is a lot more concerned about your character development than He is your comfort. I stated in my opening sentence that what if our country, I mean that our country is turning from its Judeo-Christian roots, what if a revival does not come? I think revival is our only hope in this nation. What if it doesn't come? What if we continue on this path we're on and the unthinkable happens and our nation completely collapses? How will you handle it? Will your faith crumble because it was built on the wrong foundation? The wrong hope? Now's the time to determine what you're really building on and how strong your foundation is constructed. So would you pray for our upcoming study of real life theology? Would you pray about your involvement the involvement of others in our prayer meetings. And in the future, could it be said of you, for though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Where, my friend, is your hope? I pray it's in Jesus alone.